Okay, so uh, let's just uh, get started. Uh, this is the, I, I always have an outline uh, slide that kind of keeps uh, appearing every now and then as we cover topics. So this is the rough outline. So I'm just uh, going to talk about some basics like the water cycle. Then uh, I will define the, uh, the state of India's uh, water resources, the crisis, the risks and things like that. Uh, and then move over to the solutions because we all, uh, we are engineers, we are kind of in that. I know Dr. Parthasarthi was um, emphasizing that you know, we probably need to get out of that mindset of problem, solution, problem, solution. But we are engineers, you know, we are trained, you know, and uh, we are uh, two old dogs uh, to learn these new things. So uh, we are still in that mode and, uh, well, I think there are some advantages to that mode also. So uh, we have these solutions and within the solutions, I'll talk about the demand side and the supply side. Um, you, can, you can obviously have different perspectives, you can have different approaches, but just hear me out and then you can decide which way you would like to approach the topic. Okay, so uh, I got this uh, pretty good um, picture of the water cycle. This is um, some US government uh, publication, so it is in the public domain. Uh, you can uh, use it. Uh, I'm not going to go through it. All of us understand the water cycle since our school days. Uh, but the beauty of this is that they have uh, mentioned the fluxes. For example, in forests, you know, for, for any of these um, uh, natural habitats or uh, let's say cities or whatever water bodies, there is always some influx and there is some efflux. So those numbers are given over here beautifully. And then the, for each, each uh, uh, exchange pool or reservoir, there are the, the, the numbers, the volumes are also indicated. So when you, when you go through this um, in your class, you can probably you know, just explain to the students uh, nicely you know, what those fluxes mean, what they, what they imply. Um, there is also a nice video. Uh, again, this is also in the public domain. So you could play that video. I'm, I'm going to skip this. Um, which, you know, it will, I, I, although students are supposed to know this, but uh, you'll be surprised how, uh, how many students actually remember the details. They generally understand it, but they don't remember the details. And, and moreover, they cannot correlate what they have learned uh, to the implications to uh, environmental problems and sustainable development. So that connections is, is generally lacking. This is my observation. Is it that also your observation? That we have learned concepts in school, but we don't know how to connect it to the problem at hand. So, um, you know, we, we have a, a lot of reason to rejoice that after independence, India has definitely made its mark on the world, uh, but probably not as much as many of our expectations. And uh, although in terms of, I'm talking about general development, we have a space program, we have a nuclear program, we are a, 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 an important economic power in the world, um, but I think we could have done a lot more. What is even worse is whatever development we've achieved has occurred at an unreasonably high cost, sorry. So um, one of those cost factors is the water availability. If you check the water availability around independence, it was like 5,000 meter cube per year per capita. That much water was available to every Indian citizen. But now it has de declined 2011. I just recently got this information through this reference that it has, India has now gone into water stress. 1700, 1700 meter cube per capita per year is the th threshold for water stress. India as a whole has gone under that. Uh, it means that many parts have a water scarcity or even a severe scarcity. Okay, because it, it, we, we have some regions of the, uh, of the country which have the highest rainfall in the world, right? So we have the, uh, the northeast and we have the western guards which also has pretty high uh, rainfall. So you can imagine that there are some places which have so little. So we know that uh, many villages actually lack uh, drinking water supplies and uh, even in towns and cities we know that even the domestic water, the municipal water that we get uh, many places, uh, they get it very infrequently. Uh, I am from Koimatur and uh, I hear, although we do not live in the city, our campus is uh, far away from the city, uh, but I hear that uh, water comes only once in every few days. So people actually have to fill up water. I mean, uh, th that is a city like Koimatur, which is one of the uh, most important cities in uh, Tamil Nadu. So, that, I mean, that's just a representative. I know you, you can give numbers for your city also. Um, 
So this is uh, showing, this map shows which parts of the world have, uh, are in water surplus and which are under stress and things like that. And India, you can see, is under stress. The maps are interesting. The, the um, sources are indicated over there. If you go to the, I, I strongly suggest that you go to those sources, please. Go to those sources and you may find not just this, but there are so many other things. I, I mean, while I was preparing these slides, although I had many slides prepared and all that, but when I was going through these slides, I would not get the slides completed because, I mean, it was like, uh, you know, throwing a child in a mall, you know, it wants to look at this shop and that shop and that shop. There's so many things to learn. You just read, read and read and read and you'll spend days if you have the interest. So there's so much of interesting information over there. So one question comes to our mind, if India is water stress, st stressed and uh, we, we are lacking enough water, then why, don't, why not build more dams? Good idea? How many say good idea? How many say good idea? Let's build more dams. Water availability is less. Build more dams, you'll get more water, right? Right? But you need drinking water. Ecological balance comes later. First, physical balance is required. Huh? So, when we are constructing dam, huh. the catchment area is getting What decreased. is the catchment area? Catchment area water holding, that is the mountain is retaining the rainwater. Mountains now. are not changing, no? they are the same. Area not is not all. changing. Not at all. That um, The area where we are constructing, there also the water holding as well as the water retention capacity is more, sir. The forest cover, no, it's a, it's as a sponge. Okay. Yes, sir. Awesome. We are going to discuss that. On upstream side, uh, water logging will be there. On downstream side, uh, drought problems will be there because we are constructing one barrier to the natural. Awesome. Awesome. No, that is a temporary solution to one problem, but it will raise many problems afterwards. Wonderful. I exactly wanted this. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. So, we have seen that for many large dam projects, there have been agitations, okay, like our recent uh, skit, you know, there have been social activists um, who have taken, uh, who have supported the cause of uh, the people and we have major agitations going on. Uh, people uh, must have heard about Narmada, there, is a, there are other dams also which have these agitations and this is not only restricted to India, even outside, outside of India, these problems exist. So definitely there is an other side to the story. We, we always understand the, the one side which is development and uh, long canals uh, that supply water to Rajasthan and things like that. These are the good things that uh, and water sports in the reservoir. So these are the nice things that we know about dams but then there is another side to it. Uh, I have, uh, I have videos for you. I am going to show you videos, but if you, uh, if you would allow me, let me use my discretion of which videos to show and which to restrict uh, in, in the interest of time. Okay, because I want to, this is a problem. I want to show you the videos which pertain to a solution. So we don't have time for everything. Okay. Hyperlink hai, aap log dekh lije. It's on YouTube and Narmada, you just type Narmada Bachao and you will find a thousand videos. Okay, so that's not a problem. Okay, so um, there are, there is a, uh, if you may please uh, note down, there is a World Commission on Dams and there is the International Rivers Association. How many have heard of that? They have made very comprehensive reports about dams about the way the cost benefit ratios have been calculated, have, how they have fallen short of what they should have done, how only the upstream impacts have been calculated, the downstream impacts have not been calculated. So only part of the costs have been take, considered as costs. No wonder the cost benefit ratio was favorable. Then what about the refugees, the dam refugees, uh, the, the displaced people, the austies, people who were kicked out from their land. Again, the landless people were not compensated. Then the compensations that were promised were not delivered. So these things have happened not only in India, they have happened worldwide. Moreover, in the WCD report, a very comprehensive report, they, they uh, in fact, they, uh, they talk numbers and they have very openly and unambiguously stated that vested interests, government corruption 
bureaucracy and so many factors are at play. They have not minced words. They have very openly stated these things for many countries, not only India. So I think it's a, it's a very good resource before you make any judgment on pro-dam, anti-dam, anything. Please read that report, WCD, okay, World Commission on Dams. Has everybody noted it down? Because your ability to, uh, to guide dis discussions in the class depends on how well you have read uh, the, the necessary information. Without that, you cannot uh, properly guide a discussion in, uh, in the class because students have very, very different conflicting perspectives. Okay, if dams are a problem, let's drill bore wells. Okay, again, you know, these are like band-aid solutions. You know what band-aid solutions are? Yeah, you don't, you don't fix the problem, you just stick a band-aid and move ahead, okay. It does not really solve the problem. Why does not it solve the problem? Because uh, groundwater in India is depleting and uh, in many parts uh, it is very, very serious. In uh, Even in the regions where they show it is not serious, but in locally around cities and all that it may be very serious. So uh, again that is not a solution. Uh, but then you may say, okay, if water availability is reducing, then we should reduce our use also. Why use so much water? Let us use less water. Uh, there is a problem. All the water that we harvest, out of that 87 percent goes for agriculture. Now, if you are saying do not use so much water, in other words, you are saying irrigate less, which means produce less food. But India's population, you know what is happening to it. It is growing. And uh, human diet, I think, has not changed very significantly. So, if more number of people means more food required. So, we have a, a, a problem over here. Reducing water use means reducing irrigation and less food security directly, if you, if you try to directly make connection. It does not mean there is there's not a way out. I am going to talk about ways out. So, then suddenly we get confused and we say, oh, well, whatever happened to Sujalam, Suphalam, Malayajashi, Talam? Okay, India is supposed to be the land of great rivers, eh? nice uh, forests and uh, greenery and things like that. Whatever happened to that? What we are missing is, since uh, the Vande Mataram was composed, India's population has shot up. Then our activities have changed. Industry has come up. Our water use patterns have changed. Professor Narayanan was talking about drawing water with your hand when Vande Mataram was composed versus putting a pump set, okay, versus long distance canals and major dams. So, many things have changed. So, uh, the uh, um, what held good in those days probably does not hold good anymore. This is, this is chromium containing waste being uh, released into the Ganga, the most sacred river of the Hindus. Okay, it is so sacred that we do not mind putting chromium implicated for cancer into the Ganga. That is how we, we honor things that we consider sacred to us. Um, and you know, you know, dumping uh, half burnt bodies and all those things. India sewage treatment, Professor Parthasarthi I think mentioned about this. Um, according to that report, uh, about 78 percent of sewage is uh, discharged into our water bodies um, untreated. Okay? Uh, that is not, uh, actually the number is more because 21 percent is, is the installed capacity, not the functional capacity. But that report is a little bit old. Um, I, I, I forgot to mention, uh, recently it has increased to 27 percent. Okay, so, it is not 21 percent, it is recently increased to 27 percent. Now, when we see that the water is polluted, we are engineers, we can solve problems. So, we say that, okay, let us just clean up the water, just purify it. Okay? But we have to understand that water containing a variety of impurities like microbiological, dissolved, suspended, then hardness, so many uh, pollutants when, when the water is having, it is very difficult to treat it. There is no easy way to do it. Okay? And uh, if you expect that some cheap technology is going to serve the purpose, it is honestly, it is not going to serve the purpose. Uh, I will give you a simple experiment which uh, you can just imagine. Uh, you take a glass of water, I put just a teaspoon of salt and then I say now remove the salt. It is not easy to remove the salt. Okay? Either you have to do some RO or you have to evaporate the whole water, which means how much energy? And the RO is also reject. Yeah, RO reject again. Absolutely. Then we, then we go for nanotechnology or some innovative technology. Okay? And, um, 
we expect it to be cheap but what i am proposing is that it can yes definitely it can become cheaper but in basically let us not delude ourselves into thinking that it is going to be cheap so putting chromium into the water discharging chromium into the ganga and then finding a technology to to clean it i think it is we have better intelligence than that okay and i think we should use that intelligence so um, moreover if we simply uh, restrict ourselves to making new uh, water purifiers or filters then i think we are we are missing the whole problem it, the problem is much larger we should not miss the the whole problem some people go into denial and then they say oh no there is nothing not, no problem no reason to panic indians have a tough uh, immune system we can handle everything okay but the record says that we cannot okay in 2011 uh, some 700000 children under 5 years died due to diarrhea alone this does not include other deaths okay which are also caused due to polluted water for example uh, malaria is one major killer uh, malaria again due to mosquito breeding and all that so may may have some connection with no actually the malarial mosquito i think does not um, breed in uh, heavily polluted waters right well, i'm not i'm not so sure about that okay so anyway it affects uh, poor quality water quality affects every every of uh, every one of us i'm sure that maybe in the past 5 years you must have had had a stomach upset due to this i've had more than my fair share so how do those infections then get into our water system um we know through untreated uh, sewage which enters our water bodies and big one dr partha sarthi mentioned open defecation uh, india is not number one in many aspects maybe we don't do very well in the olympics and what not but this is one place where we are probably the first and uh, these are the numbers okay um improved sanitation in urban places only 54 in rural only 21 okay in in uh, more than 50% of india's population defecates in the open and you may say that no uh, you know don't compare us with uh, advanced countries they have lots of money they have lots of water no 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 we are not comparing you with uh, european countries and all that we'll, let's compare ourselves with bangladesh if bangladesh can have an open defecation rate of only 7% and india has 50% you know what is the explanation china has 4% but you may say that no china can be considered to be a developed country fine okay so what is the solution provide modern sanitation to all sir one more thing in trains also we are having toilets yes. uh, most of the indians will be using uh, train toilets so i think some type of system and technology that needs to be developed yeah if we want to avoid the open defecation uh, yeah no we can send satellites to space i don't know why we can't construct toilets in a train toilets are there yeah, but yeah, yeah. waste yeah, i know uh, that management it is basically open defecation you know <laughs> so we may be enclosed but the material goes out in the open <laughs> so the the solution you know provide modern sanitation to all unfortunately we are discussing the water crisis we already are short of water now you want to use the available little water in a water stressed country with a rising population you want to spend all that water in flushing not the best use of water moreover it will generate more sewage so you may say if it generate more sewage no problem we are civil engineers we know how to construct etp plants right they take energy india is also undergoing an energy crisis <laughs> so the our our children do not have electricity to read and do their homework and that energy scarce electricity in this country we want to use it to treat the sewage so there is a very large deficit between the demand and supply you know in our uh, electricity production in india so uh, is this the best way to use it and considering the health cost maybe this is still a good idea uh, but i'm i'm just pointing out the problems so there are many other complicating uh, factors uh, for example you may say that uh, you know the food production which has its close relation with uh, irrigation water availability uh, that 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 has not only to do with irrigation actually it has to do with other facts also that there is land degradation 32% of india's land is degraded out of the 24% due to desertification so such soil actually can be amended by inputs of organic matter so 
so organic matter will uh, organic uh, carbon in the soil will help the soil uh, retain its fertility hold more water hold more moisture reducing the need for uh, irrigation anyway so solving this problem it has many dimensions it is going to be tough it is not something simple band aid solutions will probably not work okay now uh, this is where maybe uh, i could think of actually many activities but uh, this is one activity that i thought of where uh, i'm sure we all live in places where a polluted water body or a water source is not very far away and uh, maybe if you are taking your uh, students on a field trip or even if you cannot manage to take the child on a, uh, the students uh, on field trips you could have them do a variety of assignments which generally incorporate uh, these things like basically they can um, either if it is possible to take water samples and actually measure uh, some water quality parameters in your civil engineering lab or something like that uh, well and good if not possible uh, there could be some published literature associated with that water body in your city otherwise there could be some uh, maybe press clippings or things like that where you can just get some general information whether it is polluted or not things like that so you can have construct a variety of different assignments where the students are able to relate the water quality in their locality um, with the larger problem so the larger problem that exists in the country so and and again as a reference uh, you can use this indian standard for drinking water uh, the the water quality that uh, that is mentioned over here on various parameters how far away is that water quality Uh, from the local source compared to this one okay now uh, towards solutions so when we when we talk about solutions uh, i'm kind of partitioning it into two uh, the uh, the first one is making more water available so we are under water stress so how do we make sure that adequate water is first available secondly once it is available at in an adequate amount then how do we use it efficiently so there are two parts to it that one is the supply side and the second is the demand side so it, in two areas we can think of solutions or interventions so um let's let's look at the first one which is um the making adequate water available if you look at the rainfall map of india you will find that uh most of the country has got 40 cm of rainfall okay maybe roughly roughly 20 inches or so okay that's um that's not uh, very high but it's not too low either and if you i just made back of the envelope calculations and um i found out that if each person per capita if you have a roof area doesn't matter if it is a pakka roof or even if it is like a tent no matter what it is if you have 5 meter square area above your head and you are living in a place which has only 40 cm of rainfall average average annual rainfall you will be collecting throughout the year you will be collecting 1825 liters per capita and how much water do you actually need per day per capita so i put i put it at 5 liters you know the cooking water and the drinking water not the domestic use water okay i am only talking about the cooking and drinking okay and uh, let's say if you put it at 5 liters or if you want to put it at 6 liters you put it at 6 liters it doesn't matter okay and the 5 meter square you will be collecting around 2000 so in fact yes anything wrong in my calculation yes okay tell me as per meteorologist calculation the rainfall is generally uh, given per i mean a chamber meter by meter okay so uh, 40 cm should be 1 meter square i didn't get you right. 40 cm is the is the rainfall collected in your area right so that's 40 cm should be depth is the depth right yeah and it should be 1 meter by 1 meter chamber ha ah, 5 meter by 5 meter okay uh, no, 5 uh, meter like by 5, 5 meter. meter square okay 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 now you can make your own calculations 
Okay, so what I'm trying to explain is that the problem of treating first polluting the water and then trying to deal with the hopeless situation of treating the polluted water, badly polluted water can be completely eliminated by not allowing drinking water to get polluted. So the high technology problem of removing arsenic from the water or chromium from the water, it's a high technology, high cost, high energy problem can be completely eliminated and converted to a storage problem. Now the problem actually if you collect, rainwater is already pure. Okay, you can and uh, yes, I know there are some places it is polluted and all that. There is something called as the first wash. You may note it down, first wash. So the first few minutes of rainfall, that water is to be rejected and then only the rest of the water is to be collected. Okay, there are, you can even give a student assignment on how you would design a first wash system. It's very easy. Okay, there are many, many good ways. Okay, uh, you can just read up a little bit on that. I have my own nice ideas also. Anyway. So it becomes a storage problem and in fact since time immemorial humanity has been doing that. People have been collecting in, uh, in these forts around, we are in Maharashtra, in Maharashtra we have many forts. If you go to any fort there are like 2500, 3500, uh, 4000 uh, feet above sea level on these tall mountains there is ample water, ample water to um, serve whole armies and horses and everything. How do they do that? The western ghats get tremendous amount of rain but only in the monsoon. After that it is fully dry. So it is collected in water tanks. They, they cut rock and they make these water tanks. Then there are some percolation uh, tanks also, ponds and things like that. They are also there. Various structures are there You with community effort. Uh, Professor Parthasarthi was talking about the commons where he kind of corrected me and he explained what the commons are and that, that they are different from open sources. So the, the commons were maintained in the past. There were in, uh, I, I come from Tamil Nadu, they have these temple tanks. In, in uh, Maharashtra also we have temple, temple ponds or temple tanks. So the, the entire community together, they made sure that they maintained it in good condition. So they made it sacred. So if it is sacred, you don't pollute. No. This kind of a, a, a perversion of calling something sacred and then putting uh, poisons into it had not uh, taken place uh, at that time perhaps. Okay, this is what I am saying, reduce a, a water purification problem to a storage problem. It does not mean that other technologies uh, should not be used, the nanotechnology and all that. I will be out of business if people do not use nanotechnology. Uh, but, but I think what, what needs to be said needs to be said. Okay, there is no, there's no charm in polluting first and then purifying. So um, you can even construct an uh, activity for your students. You know the rainfall or let them collect the, the rainfall statistics in, in their city and uh, design a, a, a water, uh, rainwater harvesting system. They can also go to the nearby hardware store, calculate the piping lengths and everything and they can uh, do a cost estimate also. And there may be some uh, suppliers also, they can get some cost estimates from them. So a nice exercise. Okay, that is to supply drinking water. But what about the domestic use water? We must make sure that more water is available. For that, there is something called as watershed management. Uh, rain falls on the land and then it drains through what are known as watershed. So a watershed is that region which drains, where the rain falling on that region drains to a common point, maybe a river or ultimately the ocean. So small watersheds are parts of large watersheds which all together drain into the same place. So uh, for example, there may be a Narmada watershed there is, which is different from the Ganga Yamuna watershed, Ganga Yamuna Brahmaputra watershed which is maybe different from the Krishna watershed. So the rain that falls a little bit south that goes into Krishna, the, the rain that falls a little bit north in Maharashtra goes into Godavari. So these are different watersheds. Okay. So, when you want to make sure that enough water is available, you have to plan for the entire watershed. There are many activities and do's and don'ts that you should do throughout the watershed. Simply destroying the forest in the, in the uh, upper regions of the watershed and expecting a large collection of water in the dams and all that is not practical.
So this is an example of a watershed I have explained in great amount of uh, detail over here. There is a, um, the, the whole principle of watershed management is through community efforts, uh, through grassroots efforts, through uh, support of the community to maintain these watersheds in such a way that you slow down the flow of rainfall. Okay, I will give you an example, let us say this whole slope, okay, this is a watershed, all the rain that falls is going to, this is the ocean, all the rain is going to come over here. But if it rains there in the mountains, now it is going to reach the ocean in maybe a few days. You calculate an average velocity of water flowing in a river and uh, the kilometers and all that, you will come up with some number. In a few days, the rainwater has already reached the ocean and it cannot be used anymore. On the contrary, if you now, these you have these steps over here, if the land has, has been terraced and if you make bunds at the end of every terrace, the water will accumulate. If it accumulates, it slows down, it reduces erosion, it seeps underground. The underground flow of water is extremely slow. There are places in the world, I lived for seven years in a place where the aquifer that we were drawing water from contained water that fell as rain 100, 100 plus years ago. It is called the Floridan aquifer. The water fell as rain much uh, further away from where I was. Okay. If you do not do that, uh, uh, do you remember the, the video, Save Our Sholas? So in uh, Save Our Sholas, we saw that um, the, the rain that falls on leaves and plants gets intercepted. That is called as canopy interception, followed by trickling to the soil, followed by percolation underground. So these are all healthy things that make sure that rivers remain perennial, they do not remain seasonal. If rivers dry up in summer, we are in trouble, we do not want that to happen. So plants do that and I have shown how the raindrop impacts the soil and uh, destroys it and there are so many other things, how erosion is prevented by roots and the leaf litter and things. Um, comparison between barren land and vegetated land on various aspects related to rainfall and flow of water. Um, Watershed management, how it is actually, what are the various practices, there is a video over there. The hit film Slumdog Millionaire tells the story of a boy from the slums of Mumbai who wins millions of rupees in a game show. But winning a quiz show isn't the only way to get rich in India. Back in 1989, the village of Hiwar Bazaar in the state of Maharashtra was known for its wrestlers, bootlegging and criminality. The situation was so bad that many villagers moved to the slums of Mumbai seeking a better life. Today, Hiwar Bazaar has 52 millionaires. Not one family is below the poverty line and the village regularly wins awards for being an ideal village. The secret of how Hiwar became a town of millionaires has to do with how they took control of their shared ecosystem. How did Hiwar turn around its fortunes? One of the keys was leadership. Meet Mr. Popotrao Parar, the village Sarpanch, the leader of the democratic village government. There are three, three problems in village. First is political, second social and third economical. They also had an ecological problem. Hiwar Bazaar gets only 400 millimeters of rain every year. The village suffered from chronic droughts. But now change is become from the water. Water conservation, then water management, crop management, and also power management. So the change is become groundwater management through poverty elevation. Only they use dug well for irrigation purpose, not allowed tube wells for irrigation. Second one, more water uh, incentive crop like uh, sugar cane and banana, total ban. If they want to take this crop, they compulsory use drip irrigation, not flow irrigation. They, they took the bridge to valley approach initially because this was the highest point. They started the watershed development program from here. And then they dug trenches, did plantation activities all around the ridge 
and that's how you still have water in the percolation tanks in the village. Now the area is 90% irrigated and initially it was only rain-fed farming in this region. Another key was soil management. This will go to the pit and they'll mix some uh, other materials, water and other things in this, whatever grasses they, that are left out and then this will decompose for about a month after which it's ready to be used in the field. Can you explain why you had a ban on grazing the cattle? Uh, because the, we want to control soil erosion. Because the grazing animals, they disturb the grass uh, and also uh, tree plantation. Another factor of success was a government program that guarantees every rural person 100 days of work a year to improve either local watershed management or road construction. The National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. Total project cost is 42 lakh rupees to develop total village watershed development program and that funds come from the government of Maharashtra and it is easiest guarantee scheme, employment guarantee scheme. Hiwar Pizar also took up the ideal village rules, Adarsha Gram Yojana. This is based on free voluntary labor, ban on grazing, ban on tree cutting, a ban on liquor, and family planning. One child for one family. 20 years ago, if the family found out that there's a girl child in the womb, then they would get an abortion done and there was no family planning whatsoever. So the women were in constant pressure to produce male heirs. Now it's no longer the case. Now there are some women in the village who've even got their operations done after one girl child. It's really nice for women in the village now. There's no discrimination now between boys and girls. Finally, Hiwar worked as a unit, volunteering hours and instituting bans on abuse of common resources, banning bore wells for irrigation, water intensive crops such as banana and sugarcane, the selling of land to outsiders, and the cutting down of communal trees. Today, most of the villagers live from cash crops and dairy farming. Milk production has increased 10 times from 300 liters to 3,000 liters a day. The dung is used as a fertilizer and also as a fuel in the form of biogas, which they use for cooking. It can even be sold to Europe for use in organic farms. Up to 200 visitors a day come to unlock the secret to Hiwar's success. Um, I was just amazed at how far this village has come in the past 10 years and where it started and where it is now and I can just see it as it continue, it's just going to continually grow for the next, for, for the, ever I guess and I can't wait to see where it is in the next 10 years. Slumdog Millionaire is a compelling film but it is not an accurate depiction of the true face of poverty in India. 70% of the Indian population lives in villages. But poverty is not only about whether one lives on more or less than one dollar a day. It is also about access to environmental resources that rural livelihoods depend on. Access to soil, clean water and biomass. The GDP of the poor. Did we talk about the gross national product, but the gross nature product is one where we need to calculate literally how many hours are women spending to get firewood or water. And I think that's why we argue very clearly that it, we have to build that economic base, that natural assets of people to build an economic future. And you can do that by doing 
forestry in a way that people actually can benefit from tree plantation. You can do that by doing conservation in a way that people can ben get the benefits of conservation. You can do that by doing agriculture in a way that it is much more sustainable. So I think all this must be understood that it is really about poverty and about environment being two sides of the same coin. Hewan Bazaar proves that locally based rural development is possible and that if the resources from the Rural Employment Guarantee Act are invested in environmental capital, the returns are infinite. Gandhi's vision of India revolved around the concept of strong, self-led villages. The Hewar model is a step in that direction. Anyway, so on the on the demand side, uh, the, uh, I told you that uh, agriculture is the largest end use sector which uh, consumes water. So I, I thought that it's better to discuss in in each section how to do it, uh, and I have um, I have uh, kind of tried to do that. So um, see, this is how uh, water gets used in India. So we have to put that uh, have that perspective you know, when we uh, try to look for solutions. Um, I know I could talk a lot about how various practices in agriculture that could conserve water and maybe most of you know uh, many, many such practices. It is not possible for me to cover all of that. I will just um, give a kind of one idea as food for thought for uh, this whole uh, group and that is why not have agro ecosystems that do not take water, that do not require as much water. See, in a conventional agricultural system, definitely irrigation saving practices and planning crops and all that can be done, I agree. Okay? And we could talk for hours on end on how to do that. What I am proposing is why not have systems of agriculture which inherently are low input in terms of water, fertilizers and even manpower. Can there be systems which do not require too much of inputs? And in reality, such systems exist. They have existed for a very long time. Unfortunately, many of them are lost. But some new methods have also evolved. So, with your, if you have the patience, I will show you a 4 minute video on one such system and when you see that system, it is, it is a food forest. Why should we think of agriculture? Again, you know, they use the same logic. First pollute the water and then find a new technology to clean up the water. Okay? Instead of that, avoid polluting the water. So similarly, we, we use the same, we have the same mentality in agriculture also. Initially, destroy the natural vegetation, dig up the soil, damage the soil, destroy its structure, compact it. How do you do that? Ploughing. It is called ploughing. Ploughing destroys soil structure, compacts the soil, uproots all the, the, uh, the roots of plants, which we, we have arbitrarily decided that they are weeds. When we call them weeds, we are saying that they have no, no function. Okay? They may not have a function in giving you food grains, but they have a function in the environment. Okay? So, due to our mentality, we have, we have kind of made these assumptions. So, you initially destroy that, that kind of small habitat or whatever it is and uh, then you, you find, to, uh, find ways of increasing productivity. So, when the soil is exposed to the sun and the elements, no wonder erosion takes place. No wonder land degradation takes place, no wonder water logging takes place and then we worry about uh, and, and organic carbon gets oxidized because it is exposed to the hot, hot sun. So humus will get oxidized, right? So why create a problem and then worry about solving it? If you follow the pattern of nature, you will find that problems, problems are not born, forget about 
creating a problem and solving it. So this is a very beautiful video. I want you to write down uh, a, a word, permaculture. This is an organization. Okay, I want you to write down that name. Uh, it was uh, a movement and uh, a concept started by Bill Mollison and uh, some of his uh, friends in Australia. And uh, what you, the person you are going to see over there is Jeff Lawton, uh, who uh, kind of was one of those pioneers. And he is now, permaculture insists that food should be grown in agro ecosystems, which they call, call as food forests. Okay. And not as not in agricultural fields the way, way I explained, you know, you first destroy the soil and everything and then, and then make food. So they are against that principle and Jeff Lawton goes to this place in Vietnam and he finds that what they are preaching was practiced by the, by the ancient cultures for so many years. So you will see that this is a 300 year old uh, forest and that, that system was existent in Vietnam and also in India, by the way. You will actually find that very similar systems exist in India also. People from Kerala will definitely find resemblances. People from Konkan uh, will definitely find resemblances. This is another interesting system that we've been lucky enough to visit in Vietnam. About seven hours south of Hanoi in the province of Ha Ting. And one day when we were investigating different areas of the landscape and culture, we were asked if there was anything else we'd like to visit or anything that we could be helped with as far as getting a better record of traditional systems. And I'm always interested in old suburbs because there's often very interesting little events and, and, and happy little accidents that happen in suburbs because of the microclimate of the buildings and the streets. So that's why I'd like to see an old suburb and so I could just do a, a check on the possibilities of, of different trees and different systems that might have been established. Well this was interpreted in a form that is quite different to an old suburb that we understand in Australia or, or, or most of the developed world. When we entered the village, all the streets were extremely small and uh, guests and um, administrators of the project took us through to this little garden and it was a complete established food forest. Taro, cocoa yam, turmeric in the understory, it's just... Okay, uh, the, the concept is that uh, normally we have uh, agricultural area and our productivity is based on area. Here it is based on volume. So uh, they have seven layers of productivity. The underground layer where you get tuber crops, that is the lowest layer. Then you have crawling plants on the surface. Then you have herbs which are just above the surface. Then short trees, tall trees, shrubs, vines and emergent pines, pines which emerge even above the canopy. So there, there are these seven layers and each of those layers produce something. Obviously there is a limit based on solar energy and, and the water availability and all that. But definitely the, this is the concept of uh, filling up uh, ecological niches, you know. So you, you can actually get more, uh, even in terms of biodiversity, you get more ecosystem productivity when there is diversity. Because you are taking, you are uh, occupying different niches. Uh, so something like, this hall has, has so much of volume, but you are only on the surface, right? So we can only pack so many people. But if you had a second layer over here, you could have packed double. So that's the concept. So you can get much more uh, productivity. And these polycultures, uh, they actually are, uh, have been shown under many conditions to show what are known as over yields, meaning extra yield over and above the, the regular agriculture productivity. Ancient food forest, the whole thing. <laughs> And everything was extremely well established. Small gardens of vegetables underneath fruit trees, large fruit trees, palms, climbing productive plants like black pepper, uh, specific gardens with pineapples and turmeric and galangal and clumping onions and borders with herbs, but 
bananas, papayas, many varieties of fruit tree in the understory, emergent palms coming out of the canopy, um, small animals, even a small grazing cow under the canopy, um, deer in a compound which are used for their, their horns as a medicinal um, harvest. Um, and the old gentleman and his wife were processing some food for their, for their meal. Um, they showed us around and um, I casually asked, how long have they been there? How, how long has this system been established? And um, it turns out about two acres of ground, probably a little bit less, has been in the family for 28 generations. So it's a completely different time scale of establishment because everything has been tried and tested. Um, the bees hives were in all natural bees hives in hollow logs. Um, all the medicinal plants, in fact every plant, every tree, just about every plant and every tree in the system had a use and a story and if it wasn't a, a, a specific regularly used food it was a very specific medicine or herbal tonic and um, the knowledge was just encyclopedic right. you could write a book just on this one small garden the gentleman and his wife are both in their 80s um, and uh, their varieties of fruit trees are also um, have been there for so long um, and they are some of the older varieties that have been well tried and tested. They're actually used now as, as, as reference to the modernised area where people are coming back to these more stable, more traditional and, and in some ways a lot more productive per square metre. Complicated layers food forest systems and they're coming back for reference material and asking if they can they can share some of their genetic material because they now realise that, that it's actually a much more energy efficient system because they've, they've put in very little work for the amount of return they get and the return is constant, it's daily, it's continuous, it's just about every meal that they eat and all their medicine contained within that garden. For me it was, it was an absolute shock to try and understand the time scale of establishment I was looking at. This is something that was literally off my scale. I couldn't really see the way this had been established, it had been there so long, and it was very hard to see the interactions between the system and the people because they were literally so casual and so productive. Um, and an absolute pleasure to, to visit it. It's the second time I've visited this garden and uh, every time we're made very welcome and um, every time we learn more about how to approach design in an established form. Um, a wonderful example of tropical food for us. <laughs> this is a view of the past and a view of the future. Uh, the only possible future we have is for uh, sustainable suburbs for the food for us. We've had them before, we'll have to have them again. Yes. Yeah, similar experiments have been done in India, uh, like um, may not be exactly same, but similar concept uh, has been adopted in Auroville. And here nearby uh, Panvel, there is one small center called Yusuf Merali Center. There also they are trying to do uh, polyculture. So Polycultures are done in many places in many India. Many places, okay? but, but in, yeah, in Auroville. Basically in the traditional format of agriculture, they are doing polycultures. This is a, a kind of a completely different paradigm. No, no. here Tara what I was talking about, mm. they are growing different kinds of crops including millets, vegetables, mm. fruits. They say that you are completely dependent on that. One family can survive, they don't awesome. have to That is what is really go, required. Uh, go to market and purchase Correct. anything. So those who are in Maharashtra can visit that uh, project, it is near Tara, Pen Panvel Road. So the, the point which I mentioned in my first talk, uh, sustainable development, if you remain in the same mindset, the solutions that will come to your mind will also be of the same nature. So that, is, that doesn't guarantee solving them. If you think differently, if you think on the lines of nature, nature has solved these problems. The problems of land degradation, of 
of maintaining water, maintaining ground water, maintaining the cleanliness and quality of water. Nature solved these problems long ago. If we are not stubborn and headstrong and in fact just observe nature, I, I think solutions are, many solutions are there. does not mean technology is not required, technology is also very much required which I am going to uh, explain in my uh, next talk. There is another uh, uh, video, a very good one which I will again put up. This is a gentleman uh, and I forgot his name but he has, he has recycled his own water in his own house in Bangalore city. Uh, do you remember that diagram of the house with lot of recycling that I had in my uh, uh, sustainable development topic? So, he's actually done that. So, he separates the grey water and the black water and he grows rice on his terrace in Bangalore and he gets uh, some something like uh, more than 100 uh, kilograms of rice per year because he takes three crops based on wastewater and he recycles that water. 